Could you give me an example of an object-oriented programming language? Java? Not really. Python? No, Python is not object-oriented. Ruby? No, Ruby is not object-oriented. Or is it? So that was a question I was using for years now when I was recruiting people to my team. A question which I used to break the ice in a funny, unexpected way to surprise people and to start a debate. Propose something unexpected, hoping that there will be an interesting discussion around it. Because who on earth would say that Java, Python and Ruby are not object-oriented? So I was doing that. And I had many interesting discussions because of, of this provocative starting point during my recruitment talks. The, the next thing I was asking was, could you tell me what object-oriented programming means? What's the definition of this term? And people started saying something like, well, it's about classes, it's about inheritance, and it's about encapsulation. And then I asked, do you know who created this term, object-oriented programming? And some people knew, some other people didn't know. If they knew, we started talking about AVK, the origins of programming and origins of object-oriented programming. If they didn't know about Alan K, I asked, is it possible to use objects without classes? Is there a language which has objects but doesn't has classes? And I was saying something like, do you know this language with fake classes? And this was usually a good starting point and we started discussing um, either history of programming or we dived straight into some modern things and we were trying together go deep into the meaning of those definitions. Because as you know from the other videos, I'm very skeptic or I don't really like definitions in computer science because the, the terminology in this field is very muddled. It's, it's not precise. It's not like mathematics. So this video is not about being right or wrong or being correct or incorrect. It will be a very short journey into the history of programming and specifically into the history of object-oriented programming. So let me take you for a ride and let's see at the end if Java, Ruby or Python are really object-oriented or not and what does it mean in the end and what's the inspiration for the future, how we can learn from the past. The term object-oriented programming was coined or created by Alan Kay. So the first thing we will do, let's quickly take a look at the definition of object-oriented program programming as proposed by Alan Kay. Object-oriented programming as proposed by Alan Kay was about objects communicating through asynchronous message passing. And the core idea was that it's more about message passing than it's about objects. And later on, he tried to amend this by proposing another term, message-oriented programming. So let's try to unpack this definition. So first of all, we have objects, and these are entities that are independent. They can communicate asynchronously, which means that one such entity can send something to another entity, and the other entity may respond or not right away. So this idea was proposed as an analogy to biological systems to cells which communicate in a in this way the intention was to build software systems the same way the nature builds the world or the organisms around that and the reason for that is that this way the nature is able to create systems that can sustain a lot in this original definition you can think about objects as services it somehow resembles microservices. There are some entities and they can communicate and they are isolated. We have now those notions of containers. We can create services separated one from another. You can ask those agents, let's say, those services for something. So the core idea in this definition was the message passing. The intuition is to think about those entities as one entity is asking other entity for something and not telling the other entity to do something. So if you go back to the languages such as Java, Python, or even Ruby, you create objects 
and you define some methods. If one object asks another object for something, it uses one of those methods, so it tells the other objects what to do. In this original definition, is more about you can send any message you want. You don't have a contract. It's more that the focus is on the receiver. So receiver can, the object receiving the message, can receive any message. And the receiver decides what to do in response. It may even decide not to respond, or it, it may return the message saying, I don't know how to handle it. But that's on the receiver side to decide what to do. The caller just sent the message for asking someone to do something and not telling someone to do something. So it's more about this flat structure, like with your colleagues or your friends, you ask them for something, which is something different than with your boss who tells you to do something. Another good intuition to understand this original definition of object-oriented programming is to think about sending letters. When you send a letter, this is a message, and you can send, to, send it to anyone. So once a person receives that message, so they will read the message, they will act on the message, they will decide what to do based on, on the content of the message. That's the major difference between what was the intention in the past and what we have now, which again doesn't mean that this original definition is somehow correct or better and what we have now is, is incorrect or not good. The purpose of this video is to have this historical context and see how we can learn from that. The receiver can decide on the message on the very last moment and there is this idea of late binding which means that we postpone the decision till very late, which means that this decision is being done dynamically when the program runs, so we say at the runtime. So it means that in programming in programs like Java or, or Python or even Ruby, with a small exception I will mention in a moment, you cannot call a method if you don't know the name, and you cannot call a method which doesn't exist on an object. So you have this contract. Otherwise your program won't compile in Java. In Python and Ruby is slightly different. In the case of Ruby, we could say that this language is very close to this definition, but there, still there are some tiny things that may, in the eyes of some purists, disqualify it as a true object-oriented programming language in the sense of this original definition. The reason is that in Ruby, we have this method missing mechanism. An object can do something when it receives a message, a method call, which doesn't exist. So it's somehow close to that, but the difference is that the message being sent is a symbol and it's just a wrapper around a, a traditional method call. Uh, but it's very close to that. So in that case, which programming language is the closest one to this original definition proposed by Alan Kay? And it seems that the one that somehow feels all the gaps is Erlang. Funny enough, Erlang is considered to be a functional programming language and yet it fits the definition, this original definition, quite nicely. Because in Erlang you have this concept of actors, those entities, and they can send messages one to another and they do it in a synchronous way. So next time if a programmer asks you about an object-oriented programming language, you should send something tricky and you should answer Erlang. Unless you are being asked by a recruiter, in that case you should respond Java or Object or Python or Ruby because that would be probably the good response in that context. So another reason why those languages Java, Ruby, Python and any other one, the, the modern object-oriented programming languages, don't fit the definition, the initial original definition by Alan Kay, is that in this original definition the objects are independent they decide what to do in response to the messages. So it means that you cannot have setters, you cannot have getters on your objects and uh, you just send them messages and they decide on their own what to do. And in those languages we mentioned Java, Ruby and Python, you have setters. In, in the case of Java, setters and getters are abused very much. Python and Ruby are are slightly different, but again, you know, the terminology is muddled, 
it's not precise, so it's not the point. The point is more about learning from the past. But if you were trying to prove something, you could argue that uh, those languages are not object-oriented in its or original sense. So in 1998, there was this interesting uh, email sent by Alan Kay. In this email, he clarifies that the term object-oriented was more about objects communicating through message passing and not about classes, not about inheritance. And he says that this, um, this other points, classes, inheritance, it's something that may be important, but, but it wasn't the intention to, to focus on those concepts. The intention, the intention was to focus on the message passing. And he says in this email that the big idea is messaging, which again is not the case for any of the languages I, I mentioned at the beginning. But today we use the term object-oriented programming in a different way. So it's just different. It's not correct or incorrect. It's different. And we can't forget those concepts constantly evolve. And today many people say that object-oriented programming is dead, but I don't think so. I think it's just another chapter. There are many ideas that converge. The focus today is more on the functional programming, but I think there will be some convergence soon. In order to do that and to follow along and to understand all those developments, it's very important to know the past. Uh, so today we learned a little bit about the past. So this, this subject is quite, we could talk about it much longer. So if you're interested, I can do some other videos when I will specifically address some points and some concepts that were mentioned, such as late binding, message dispatching, polymorphism and, and, and so forth. We can dive into that. But what I want to want you to get from this short vlog is that it's important to know the history and knowing both the original definition of object-oriented programming and the modern definition of object-oriented programming is important. So now you have some, some arguments when someone tells you that Java is object-oriented, you may say that it's not and you may cite the things we discussed. The same goes for Python and Ruby. You can start an interesting debate and I hope this will inspire you to study this subject on your own and learn more about it. See you next time. Before you go, I would like to invite you to my newsletter. I'm not very active on social media and I think email is the best way to communicate. So if you'd like to stay up to date, I will be sending one email per week, Friday evening, with all the materials we did during that week and some additional ones as well. Tips and tricks, articles. If you are interested, it'd be great to have you. See you next time.